Good evening and welcome back to my channel. I am the Loyal Hufflepuff and tonight we will continue our reading in Slaying the Giants in Your Life by David Jeremiah. This book goes over all the different giants such as fear, anxiety, temptation, facing all those things and there's 12 chapters and each chapter goes over a different uh, giant or in this case a big giant hurdle um, and how to conquer those. I hope this book has been help helping you guys out. I know it's been helping me out and let's go ahead and get to chapter 7. <clears throat> Peter came, fr came from Goodstock Bible-believing, church-going people. But there was something in him, some indefinite spark of rebellion, that began to appear in his adolescence. When Peter went off to college, he basically swept God from his, swept God from his life. He fell into a life of moral laxity, hung out with poor influences, and built a lifestyle that made for a troubled marriage by the, by the time he was halfway through his 20s. Why then did he become a policeman? It may have been the course correction of a life flying out of control. Perhaps he fled from a lawlessness to one built around enforcement. Whatever the case, the change meant something to Peter. It symbolized a new order and discipline. Life was on the upswing for him. Above all, he could build a strong marriage and a tight-knit family. To that end, he put in the necessary hours and gave his best. When Peter's wife became pregnant, this was only a confirmation that all his dreams were on the verge of fulfillment. That's when the bomb hit. That's when the pink slip arrived. Peter stared at the little note in disbelief. There had been no warning, and the chief offered no explanation whatsoever. Peter was beginning to give was being given his wa walking papers. His services were no longer required. All the years of development, de sorry, all the years of devotion to police training, all his loyalty and commitment, and now with a pregnant wife, huge debts, and no prospects, Peter was rejected, discarded like dirty linen. As he stared at the dismal in his hands, the pink slip became purple in rage. Sorry, it became purple rage. The slip crumpled. The hands clutched it like claws. They were strong hands. Now they were, they were itching for vengeance. Peter went home and tried to make the best of things, but there was no best to be found. At night, he lay awake, thinking only of his chief. He tried to focus on the future, but his rage kept pointing back to the smug face of the man who had fired him. Late at night, the mind of an in insomniac will move in many strange directions. Only days earlier, he wouldn't have believed it, but now Peter found himself plotting a murder, and the purple rage deepened to black. Perhaps it began as a mental exercise, just a way for, of coping with his feelings, but fantasies often create their own reality. Peter began to re rehearse in his mind the details of premeditated murder. He had the guns. His employment had trained him well in their use. He had also been taught about criminals and the mistakes they got them, that got them caught. Peter could avoid those mistakes. Who else but a well-trained cop was equipped to commit the perfect crime? But the odds of apprehension were a moot point. In truth, he didn't care. So black was his rage that he was willing to pay any pr price, prison, execution, the loss of his family. None of those things dealt, dealt in the forefront of his mind. His mind had no room for anything but rage. The world is an angry place. Who can say why the word rage has developed so many qualifiers? I'll leave that to the sociologists, but you need only pick up your morning newspaper to read about the following manifest Infestations actually credited to news stories. Road rage, parking rage, air rage, boat rage, surf rage, rage, 
fishing rage, river rage, pedestrian rage, pavement rage, jogger rage, biker rage, tucker rage, cell phone rage, shopping rage, grocery cart rage, and checkout line rage. I'm told there's such a thing as pew pit rage. Though I haven't actually witnessed it at our church yet. I haven't seen it either. We might observe that rage is all the rage. But of course, we're talking about a serious matter. What makes anger so elusive and so incredibly dangerous is that it flares suddenly, powerfully, and irrationally. It takes no counsel of the future. It takes no counsel of personal safety, even one's own. If we were dealing with a lengthy fuse, there would be no problem at all. Would there? We'd, th we'd think, wait, I smell smoke. I hear that the fuse I was has been lit. I'll, get, I'll go get a bucket of water to douse the flame. But it's not a lengthy fuse. It's a short fuse that you and I have to contend with. And when someone with a short fuse is behind the wheel of a car moving at 70 miles per hour, or within reach of a handgun, or even simply in possession of a balled up fist or an eloquent tongue, then anger becomes a harmful thing. It's as old as sin itself. Of course, certainly as old as Cain. But I believe we've seen toxic anger climb to new levels in our generation. Until recently, I hadn't been followed off the freeway by an angry driver after I had accidentally cut him off. I hadn't counseled junior high students who had seen their friends murdered in school hallways. I hadn't seen rage, life rage, flame out of control to the point that we're afraid to venture into public. But there we have it, life rage. There are people who spend their entire adult lives in anger. And, all, and we all know that explosive substances are a danger not only to the targets, but also to those who set them and to innocent bystanders. Anger is the acid that can harm the vessel in which it is stored even more than the person on whom it is poured. If you struggle with toxic, toxic anger, then you're in more danger than anyone else. We have much to learn from God's word about anger the anger epidemic. First off, we need to recognize the sinless anger. Ephesians 4, 26-27 is simple and profound, and a bit of a surprise. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. We don't expect a biblical command to be angry. We've seen all the damage anger can cause. We recognize it is it as a product of sin. So why does Paul tell us to be angry, especially when he is about to write in verse 31 that we should put all anger away from us? Is this some kind of contradiction? No, of course not. The indication that we're dealing with with a different sorry, the indication is that we're dealing with a different kind of anger. Could there be some positive or sinless form of it? If Paul is advising us to be angry, that's exactly what Paul is talking about when he tells us to be angry but not to sin. We're going to take a close look at the ultimate model of that principle. Jesus Christ himself. It's possible to use anger positively, and he showed us how. On the other hand, let's be clear on one point about anger. Some people use this passage to justify venting their anger, acting it out physically, as a positive and therapeutic thing. Pop psychologists love giving this advice, particularly that new breed known as the radiotherapist. Don't hold it in, they say. Go let it out. Find the person who has ticked you off and give them an earful. And it's no wonder, of course, that these radio doctors are popular. They tickle the ear with pleasing prescriptions. Let's remember They'd rather have high ratings than high righteousness. Television, radio, and the movies understand that we savor anger, as we'll see. And they love to egg people on to play out their carnal passions. Biblical anger. The Bible, of course, offers no option for acting out anger. 
As a matter of fact, the Bible forbids us from even indulging it in our minds. In his popular paraphrase, The Message, Eugene Peterson renders Matthew 5.21 this way, You're familiar with the command to the ancients, Do not murder. I'm telling you that anyone who is so much as angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder. And there are many other scriptural condemnations of anger. In Galatians 5.20, fits of rage are listed as sins of the evil nature. Proverbs 29.11 tells us, A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. James 1.19-20 adds, Therefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Psalm 37, 8 instructs, cease from anger and forsake wrath. It only causes harm. We've come to a point at which secular experts are beginning to rethink the conventional wisdom about the healthiness of anger venting. In her book, Anger, the Misunderstood Emotion, Carol Travis writes that the psychological rationale of for acting out our anger does not stand up under experimental scrutiny. The weight of the evidence, she claims, indicates precisely the, op the opposite, that expressing our anger only increases it, solidifying a hostile spirit and a harmful, harmful habit. Why then does Paul tell us to be angry? Is there such a thing as anger without sin? I believe we find that answer by investigating the life and emotions of Jesus. He is our model in all things, anger included. Anger, the anger of Jesus. Jesus expressed anger on more than one occasion. You may already be thinking of the most famous of these, his encounter with the money changers at the temple. The Apostle John places the account of this event right at the front end of his gospel. In chapter 2, we learn that Jesus came to the great house of God and found a thriving business venture in process. The selling of sheep and oxen, the exchange of money, and the making of fortunes. Jesus, Jesus carefully constructed a whip made of cords, and he set about driving out all the purveyors of the sacrifice industry. Not only that, he overturned the tables and let all the money fall to the floor. John 2, 14-15 this passage, of course, is a wonderful antidote to the gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Conception popularized by Victorian art and certain old songs. There's nothing meek and mild about a man walking through the temple with a whip, terrifying humans and animals alike. To understand Jesus' anger, we have to understand the money changers. They were practicing a kind of e ecclesiastical extortion on the holiest ground in the world. This was the only place where people could come to worship God on the high holy days, and they were instructing to bring a sacrifice. Sorry, instructed to bring a sacrifice. They would bring the best from their flocks, their most unblemished lambs, only to be turned down by the priest's inspection. The priests, of course, had a sweet deal with the men over the money tables who happened to have acceptable stock, guaranteed to pass inspection. The prices were like con concession prices in a modern-day stadium or theater, sky-high in the absence of competition or controls. So people were coming to worship God, and they were being inst institutionally cheated. But there was more that raised the ire of Jesus. The merchants had set up shop in the court of the Gentiles, this was the outer court of the temple, and the only place provided for non-Jews to worship. Needless to say, it was a special thing to have Gentiles come to worship the one true God, and historically this court was specially set aside and protected. But the merchants had cut it off, they had filled it up with all the supplies and baggage and essentials of their trade. The Gentiles had no other place to go, and Jesus who knew he had come to seek and to save the lost, including lost Gentiles, could in no way accept such a thing. Now we can see why the anger bubbled up inside the Son of God. But what was remarkable about his anger? 
What sanctified it as compared to yours or mine? The key is in the object of his wrath. Jesus was not angry at injustices done to him. We see no anger at all when he was hauled before Herod or Pilate, when he was beaten or mocked. We see no anger when a crowd backed him up to a cliff at the beginning of his ministry. His anger was a righteous anger directed at injustice against people and against God. His anger was not about self, but about God. How can we say that, that about our own anger? Sadly, we have plenty of anger about our own issues, but very little about the things that concern God and the issues he cares about. We feel very little emotion over starving or homeless children, persecution of Christians abroad, or people dying without hearing the gospel. Righteous anger is never about ourselves. It's always forgetful of self. We can always observe we can also observe that Jesus had a measured rational rational response, not only a temperamental one, to the injustice he saw. He carefully constructed the cords, then brought about a practical resolution by clearing the court of the Gentiles. This was not an uncontrolled tantrum about a redemptive action. There's another eliminating example of Jesus' anger. One day, a man with a withered hand was brought before him. Jesus felt, Jesus felt immediate compassion for the handicapped man and healed him on the spot. But controversy was aroused because it was the Sabbath. Uh, hang on one second. Yeah, there is. And this would be a technical violation of its ordinances. Mark 3, 5 tells us in no uncertain terms that Jesus looked around at them with anger, grieved by the hardness of their hearts. He was frustrated because the people didn't get it. They didn't comprehend what the Hebrew laws were truly all about. They didn't comprehend compassion and a redemptive love that could override the fine print of the Hebrew law. And they didn't comprehend what Jesus himself was all about. So he was angry, righteously angry. Aristotle phrased it well. A man who is angry on the right, right grounds against the right persons in the right manner at the right moment and for the right length of time deserves great praise. The anger of Jesus embodied every clause in that statement. There is such a thing as righteous, sinless anger, but approach it with care. Look deeply into your heart before accepting it in yourself. The right kind of anger is admirable, but the wrong kind is an abomination. Now we come to the other face of anger, renouncing sinful anger, the kind Paul refers to later in the same chapter. He describes this kind in more detail, offering some of the forms it's likely to take. Let all bitterness with wrath anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, Ephesians 4.31. This is the kind of anger you and I know so well. We all claim to be expressing righteous indignation from time to time, but most of the time, what we're really talking about is garden variety anger, bitterness, grudges, wrath, rage, clamor, tantrums, and evil speaking, a tongue dipped in poison. We all have our weak spots, our pet peeves that get inside us and work on our emotions until we're struggling with anger. We have to live in a hurtful world. There is so much to be angry about. So what can we do about it? How can we handle our anger? Let's look at some positive prescriptions. Prescriptions, yeah. Don't nurse your anger. Remember that anger is at some point a choice. We saw this same principle with temptation in the preceding chapter, or in this case, the preceding in the previous video. The moment when the escape hatch swings open, in one defining moment, we can choose to put away the impure feelings, as Paul counsels us to do, and we can build a little nest the moment we take note of an angry impulse and refuse to send it away. We put the first twig into the nest into that nest 
and we all know what happens in a nest sooner or later. Something hatches and flies out. The Bible tells us not to let the sun set on our anger. That's simply an eloquent way of saying to clear all your accounts before the day is over and to start each day with clean books. Enforce a 12-hour limit on feelings of, re of resentment. After that, they should be wiped as clean as God wipes your own sins. I'm not aware of a bi Bible paraphrase authored by, by Phyllis Diller, but I know she has said, Never go to bed mad. Stay up and fight. I hope she means to bring things out in the open and come to a righteous resolution. Wiping the slate clean isn't the same as sweeping things under the bed. If, we're, if only it were easy to take this advice. But you may have noticed that of all the seven deadly sins, anger is the one that tastes the best. This is the one we actually enjoy. Perhaps the word is that we savor our anger. We take it in, welcome it, build the nest. Then we begin fantasizing speeches, thinking about how to get even, devising plans of attack. Peter, the policeman who opens this chapter, or in this case, this video, illustrates the danger of nurtured anger. What happens when those fantasies take on a life of their own? They may conceivably become more than fantasies. Think of all the angry speeches you've devised as you lay tossing and turning in bed. What if you really said all the things that passed through your mind? Would you like them to be published in a book for your friends and family to read? I'm glad this publisher hasn't done that little favor for me. That's that's not a book. I'm eager to put I'm eager to put into print. It would cause me great sorrow and distress. Yet we enjoy composing those co covert, undeliverable speeches. We savor our anger. So it's so hard to let, to let go. A ministerial friend counseled a woman who had been divorced for many years. After all this time, she was still attending divorce recovery seminars. She was still spouting off all her rage and bitterness about the husband who had abandoned her for another woman. The leader asked her, Why can't you move on with your life? Why can't you let go of your anger? She replied, Because it's the only story I have. It's a sad commentary. Sometimes we need to write the end on the story. Unhappy ending and all. And begin a new and fresh chapter. Nurtured anger is no way to live. The grudge is a kind of cancer that attacks the soul, bringing it, bringing it with it feelings of dark cynicism. This is why we say anger is toxic. It becomes a poison that will eventually kill the spirit. Hebrews 12.15 warns us to be careful gardeners. We're not to let any root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble, defiling the garden of our relationships. Clear all accounts when the sun goes down. Realize that if someone owes you, you're probably in debts as well. You're sorry, you're probably in debt as well. And be content to break even on the relationship books. We have a we have to remember that the Bible tells us to avoid any debt other than the debt of love. Don't rehearse your anger. You and I know people who love to tell us all about their anger in great detail. They're practically artists of anger, with resentful words as their medium. Perhaps it's the only story they have, or perhaps their anger is preventing them from having any other stories. Wait till you hear the latest. They say as they hurry to your side in the hallway, their anger so con consumes them that they've lost sight of how thoroughly unattractive anger is in a person. When I was a young man just beginning my ministry, I heard a speech about Henry Brandt on this topic. He believed that it's a fallacy, fallacy to say that some other person makes us angry. According to Brandt, that's something that can't be done. If we become angry, it's because we had anger already within us and we allowed someone else to pull it out of us. But no one can make us angry. As time goes on by, 
sorry, as time has gone by, I've seen the wisdom in his words. There are people who maintain their own little anger factories within themselves, and they keep a steady supply on hand. Nearly anyone can make them angry. The same thing done or said to someone else wouldn't even bother them. Some people simply have more buttons to push. Some people are nothing but buttons. The main process in the manufacture of anger, of course, is the rehearsing of it. We go over and over what someone said. We begin to find new meanings in it. We build it up to something that may not have, e that may not have even bothered us much at the time. But we fed the fire until the flames are high. The rehearsals of anger is a dangerous thing. Don't converse about your anger. The mouth is a deadly weapon. Don't let it be a promoter of anger. Ephesians 4.29 tells us, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. That word corrupt carries the idea of cutting. Don't let any cutting remark escape you. Unfortunately, that's almost an indoor sport in our com contemporary culture. It's a cynical, smart mouth age we live in. Haven't you noticed? We use so much disrespect that we've abbreviated the word into dis. Don't diss me, man. We spend plenty of time cutting the boss, the pastor, the children, the parents, the neighbors. The list, of course, is limited only by the number of acquaintances we have. So some today are willing to make cutting remarks in public about their spouses. As widespread as sarcasm is, there's no place for it in the Christian vocabulary. Not if we're not for to hold the New Testament as our authority. At one time, I had a friend who was a master of the cutting comment. He kept his blade plenty sharp. We'd, had, we'd have a lunch date, and he would begin cutting into me. I took it with good humor, because that's the way it was meant. As a matter of fact, I decided I might as well fight fire with fire. I began to cut him right back, all in fun. But time went on. And this mock adverse, adversarial exchange became the pattern of, for our relationship. And finally, I began to sense a change in my friend's spirit. One day, I noticed he didn't seem to want any part of me. I couldn't even get him to look me in the eye. He was now too busy for the lunches he used to share, we used to share. Finally, I confronted him about it. My friend immediately pointed me to a conversation I'd completely forgotten. I had made a joke. <clears throat> I've made some joking observation of him without meaning it at all. But I'd hit a nerve. He took it very personally, nurtured it in his heart, and developed a spirit of, bitter of bitterness. The remark, innocent as it was on my part, had poisoned our friendship. On that day... I vowed before God that, as much as it was possible on my end, I'd clean that brand of conversation right out of my life. Words are too <clears throat> words are too powerful to be used carelessly. From then on, I began to use words to say what I really meant. Nothing more, nothing less. When it comes to words and you fight fire with fire, Someone always ends up getting burned, getting burned. <clears throat> I'm grateful there's something better for us. According to Ephesians 4.29, our alternative is to say, what, what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers? That sounds much more attractive, doesn't it? Rather than running down people, we can spend the same time edifying them using the tongue as a vessel of grace. That's one of the marks of the, of the Christian. We also need to keep in mind that conversation is infectious. If you hang out with a sarcastic crowd, that spirit will seep into your sooner or later. That's what Proverbs 22, 24 through 25 is trying to tell us. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man do not go lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. 
Have you ever considered this? The relationships you choose may be sitting, may be setting a soul trap. Don't disperse your anger. Proverbs 19.11 says, The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and it is to be his glory to overlook a transgression. Sinful anger isn't about offering a rebuke. It's about indulging in a tantrum. Temper tantrums, of course, are identified with little children. My grandson is angelic, and I wish there was some room for my snapshots of him here in this book. But I've seen a few tantrums, too. Occasionally, David Todd wants something that isn't available to him. So he does what every child his age does. He squeals, he pounds his fists, he kicks his feet, he rolls on the carpet. He expresses every ounce of the anger and frustration within him because he hasn't yet reached the age where self-control is possible. Most of us don't reach that age. We do master our emotions to differing ex extents. There are some adults who indulge in very adult temper tantrums. They may not roll on the carpet or squ squeal, but they act out their they act out their emotions on their own terms. When you must deal with anger, don't nurse it. Don't rehearse it. Don't converse about it. Don't disperse it. Instead, you must reverse it. Reverse your anger. Anger in reverse? What does that mean? We've all done things we've wished we could reverse. We've broken something or said something or done something, and we've wished we could rewind the film of life and reverse the damage. But time is irreversible. The Bible offers an alternative way to reverse things. As a matter of fact, the scriptures are filled with this pres prescription. It seems like sheer foolishness to the world. On those rare occasions when the world sees it, if someone makes us angry, we offer love in return. If someone threatens harm, we feel compassion for the forces that made him or her that way. Instead of retaliation, we offer redemption. Romans 12.20 says, If your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him a drink. For in, doing, for in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. That's a verse that used to puzzle me. I'm supposed to offer comfort to the enemy, and for the purpose of what? Heaping burning coals on his head? I decided to get to the bottom of this passage, and what I discovered fascinated me. I found out about an old Egyptian custom. A person, commit, a person committed some kind of misdeed, and he felt the need to express his shame and, contrish, and contrition to show everyone the burning shame within his heart. This person would place a pan of hot coals on his head. That's the actual background of this, mis of this misunderstood New Testament passage. If someone wrongs you in some way, see what happens when you return right for wrong. The other person's shame becomes as visible as a pan of hot coals sizzling on his head. As a matter of fact, that mental image may it may itself be enough to turn your snarl to a smile. This is what we mean by reversing our anger. We turn base human reactions in, on their head. We we pay out the reverse of what we might feel or of what has been done to us. Is this an easy thing to do? No, not at all. It takes healthy doses of wisdom, maturity, and self-control, but the results are well worth it. I found that, that out one day not too long ago. It was a busy day. I had to eat lunch on the run. So I drove up to the drive through window of a local fast food restaurant. I suppose I had my mind on my order, and I didn't see the woman who was approaching the line of cars from the other direction. Apparently I cut off her intended route. It was completely unintentional, unintentional. But she didn't, she didn't see it that way. She was furious. The woman rolled down her window and gave me a piece of her mind. More than a piece. She served me a second helping. She shouted some obscenities I hadn't heard in a long time. 
She used hand gestures. She honked her horn. It was a multimedia presentation, to say the least. One of the most detailed dispersals of anger I'd ever seen. And by the time her volcano was out of molten lava, there she was behind me in line, and we were both waiting for lunch. I admit that I reached over and locked my doors. But I, I, but I also had a sly idea. As I was getting my food, I asked for the total bill for the woman behind me. The waitress asked, Is she one of your relatives? <clears throat> Certainly not, I said. That thought sent a cold chill up my spine. But still, I'd like to pay for her dinner. Well, that's very nice, said the drive through waitress. So I paid for both of us. I confess that I couldn't help but but wait around and furtively adjust my rearview mirror because I wanted to see the woman's response. She was in total shock when I saw her again. It was as if she had seen the supernatural and maybe she had. She had just attacked some stranger with all her claws and he had bought her lunch. It was a full scale reversal. We reversed not only what we might have done, but certainly how we're going to feel about it afterward. I don't know how she feels about it today, whether it's hot coals or hot lava, but I feel good about the incident. I feel that I proved the truth of the biblical prescription. Any armchair quarterback can tell you that when you feel pressure up the middle, you call a reverse. We show that we don't have the, that molten stuff inside us. We're all out of worldly wrath, but we have plenty of loving kindness, tenderness, and forgiveness in stock. We go heavy on the grace and the benefit of the doubt. We find some way, some action to encourage the aggressor. And in the process of doing all this, I can guarantee, I can guarantee you there's no anger your soul can whip up that won't be dissolved by the power of godly grace. Grace isn't the natural way to behave. It's the supernatural way. The world should be able to expect Christians to do something beyond the natural thing. To be able to take all the wrong and evil and persecution the world can dish out. And to meet it with a double dose of love and compassion. This is the visible evidence of God. It's the most powerful witness you can possibly offer. It's a living picture worth a thousand words. Reuben Hurricane Carter was a boxer who went <clears throat> from the headlines to Hollywood. He was wrongly convicted of three murders. He spent two decades in prison, paying the price for someone else's crime. But he finally won his freedom. A book and a movie told the story of his troubles. How would you feel if it happened to you? Sitting in that cell alone for 20 years, what thoughts and emotions would be likely to circulate through your mind? I'll let Reuben offer you these thoughts about his nightmarish experience. The question invariably arises. It has before, and it will again. Reuben, are you bitter? And in answer to, to that, I will say, after all that's been said and done, the fact that the most productive years of my life, between the ages of 20, 29 and 50, have been stolen. The fact that I was deprived of seeing my children grow up. Wouldn't you think I would have a right to be bitter? Wouldn't anyone under those circumstances have a right to be bitter? In fact, it would be very easy to be bitter. But that has never been my nature or my lot, to do things the easy way. If I have learned nothing else in my life, I have learned that bitterness only consumes the vessel that, con that contains it. And for me to permit bitterness to control or to infect my life in any w way whatsoever would be to allow those who imprisoned me to take even more than, tw than the 20 year, 22 years they've already taken. Now th that would make me an accomplice, accomplice to their crime. Reuben Carter might have whirled up a hurricane of emotions inside himself. Most people would have done so, but he knew that one crime was enough. Why perpetuate, perpetuate it? Somewhere all evil, 
All wrongdoing must be punctuated. Someone must put down a period instead of a comma. Otherwise, life is one long sentence without par parole. Ribbon Carter felt his sentence was long enough. So he walked away a free man, free not only of the bars of steel, but also of the ones we impose on ourselves. Anger can be punctuated. We do so when we reverse it and release it to God. One day, many years ago, a man was beaten and tortured. He was spat upon and robbed. He endured every insult imaginable. Then he was nailed to a cross, hanging there in darkness and mockery, blood flowing from nearly every part of his body. He might have yelled out curses to all his killers. As a matter of fact, he might have done much more than that. Awesome power was in his grasp. But Jesus reversed the evil. He took it all within his aching body and offered a prayer of forgiveness. They know not what they do, he said. And, it, and isn't that almost always true when, we, when we've been wronged? People know not what they do. When Jesus chose that reaction, the greatest of all miracles occurred. Sin wasn't ignored. It was healed. Death, it, death itself was destroyed. A long chain of evil dating all the way from, from creation was broken. And even more, a new pattern was established. You and I to live out that pattern. Good for evil. Blessings for curses. Compassion for aggression. The day we do this, the miracles begin. The day we do this, we're liberated from a self-imposed prison and granted the freedom to live in peace and joy. Peter stood before his gun cabinet, oiling, polishing, plotting. His plans had been destroyed and someone had to pay. He was on the verge of becoming the very thing he had sworn to fight, of violating the most sacred law he had sworn to uphold. Peter heard the metallic click of the gun shells rolling onto the, the chamber, into the chamber. His mind was filled with angry voices urging him on, except for one voice. It was different from the rest. What was this? There was the sound, the feel of prayer within the buzzing of his head. It made no sense at all. Somehow, some part of Peter was praying as the rest of him was plotting. He stopped, listened, and found himself embracing the words that seemed to come directly from his soul. Please, God, stop me. Don't let me take this man's life. Don't let me be don't let me dishonor my wife and my unborn child. I ask you now, Lord, restrain my hand. And just like that, the spirit of vengeance was broken. Whatever there was in Peter that had been bound for evil, now it had taken flight. Peter knelt and trembled and wept. Then he put away the guns and the plans and the rage and he walked out the door to find a new job. But no job was to be found, and to be honest, and sorry, and to be honest about it, there was still a fair amount of bitterness within Peter. It was a more rational bit bitterness. That was all. He still hadn't made things right with God. In the weeks to come, as he continued searching for a new career, his wife finally went into labor. Like many firstborns, this one came with a great deal of pain and struggle. Labor lasted the longest 12 hours Peter had ever spent, and he prayed nearly, nearly every moment of it. Help my wife, Lord. Help my child, as he talked to God simply and honestly. It seemed as if God was saying, was saying something back to him. He suddenly came to understand that he hadn't known God at all, and that without him, there could never be any peace in his life. There in the hospital, he committed himself fully to the Lord. After the baby came, Peter was making phone calls to share the news, trying to call his parents. He accidentally dialed his own number and decided to go ahead and check messages. A man was trying to reach him, to offer him a job. The work began the next day. Was Peter interested 
Of course he was. Peter's trainer turned out to be a man who loved the Lord intensely, a man who quickly perceived what was happening in his young co-worker's soul. He trained Peter in much more than work over the next few weeks. The same God who had restrained Peter's hand had sent an angel to nurture his soul. God must love me a lot, Peter thought. It was hard to take in. Today, today, Peter is a new man. He's a committed husband, a loving father to his children, and a growing child of God. Every aspect of his life is flourishing. There is a miracle in every corner, and every bit of it was almost destroyed by the demons of anger. Are you angry? Release your anger to God. See what miraculous thing can be wrought from it. He loves you as much as he loves Peter. That was the end of chapter 7. I hope that uh, encouraged encouraged you to let go of whatever anger you have. Each of us has a, has a different anger that's within us. Whether it's anger with the job we have, whether it's anger with someone that hurt us in the past, anger over what one person has, what one person has accomplished, anger within ourselves. No matter what it is, anger can be manifested and turned into and can be turned into a disease like we what we just read. Maybe you're angry with your life right now. Or maybe you're angry because you don't understand what's going on with your life. Maybe you're angry and you lost your job. Maybe you're angry because you failed classes. Maybe you're angry for whatever reason, whatever reason that may be. Know that you can let go of your anger. Let go of that, you can let go of that anger right now and give it all to God. If you, if you want to accept Christ in your heart, but that anger is holding on, is still holding tight to you, telling you to hold on to that anger just a little longer, just for right now, let go of that anger. Whatever anger that you have holding up inside of you, put it off to the side for just one moment and pray that God will will give you the strength to let go of the let go of the anger and give it that anger to him. If you're not born if you're not a born again Christian and you want to have Christ in your life and you want Christ to, and you want to give God all that anger, I encourage you to pray with me. And we'll do this in just a moment. But I am encouraging you right now. Whatever anger you have, I urge you to please let it go. It's not going to help you in the long run. It's not going to help you in the short run. It's not going to help you at all. It's going to slow you down. It's going to get you distracted. I know it's going to draw you even as a Christian, anger is going to draw you away from Christ. Anger ruins relationships, especially a relationship with Christ. If you are ready to let go of that anger and give it to Christ, go ahead and pray with me right now as we close this out. Lord, please forgive me of my sin, Lord. Lord, forgive me of all the anger that's developed inside of me, Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross to pay for my sin. Thank you for rising for rising from the dead that so that way we may be with you in heaven. Lord, thank you for for forgiving me of my sin. And from this day forward, I choose to follow you for the rest of my life. And in Jesus name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you are now a child of God. It's, your life's not going to be perfect. But at least it's a step in the right direction. Any anger that you hold on to. 
Just give it to just give it to God. It doesn't matter when you watch this video or whoever's watching this video. Whenever you see it, just think about what we just read and think about what anger is what what's making you angry. And once you know what that what's making you angry, go to God. Let it let God have control over it. And that way you can just let the rest of the day go by or the week go by knowing that God's got it. God's in control of what you have. I hope this encouraged you guys. I hope this book has been a huge encouragement. If it has been, please comment down below. If you want to continue to support my channel, I'm, so, I'm glad that you guys have been encouraging about you guys have been encouraged about what we've been reading. I know I've been a, it's been a we've I've been on a break, and it's been a long break. But now we're back, and hopefully we can get this routine done and taken care of. I hope you all have a good night. This is the loyal Puffle Puff, and I really hope you all have a wonderful evening.